This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we turn to look at the rising tide of far-right extremism in Norway, in Sweden and elsewhere in Europe, despite the increasing prevalence of anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant sentiment in the country and region, many were surprised that the attacks were carried out by a Norwegian nationalist. The head of the security program at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo said he was one among many who thought the attacks were carried out by al-Qaeda. I was among those who first thought in the first 24 hours after the attack that we, it was a jihadist or al-Qaeda-inspired uh, attack. Uh, and there are a few reasons why that might be plausible. Uh, and I think uh, that was really the only uh, scope of threat that was considered by the Norwegian security services. So now that we find out that it's a right-wing extremist, we're all, all the more uh, surprised. And I think that the security services were even uh, more surprised. No. There was nothing, the statements from the security service are that there was nothing about uh, this man uh, which came up, which should have come up on the on the security uh, intelligence radar. Uh, everything he was doing was in, within the realm of legality, and there was really no reason to suspect him, and yet there was every reason to suspect him. That was Peter Burgess of the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. According to observers, many of Anders Breivik's views have increasingly moved into the mainstream. Right-wing parties have also re-entered European politics in recent years, including the Dutch Party for Freedom, the Sweden Democrats, the True Finns, the National Front in France, the National Democratic Party of Germany. Europe's right fringe has secured seats in numerous national and regional parliaments across the con continent. Well, the man whose work we turn to now is known less for his extensive research into right-wing extremism in Scandinavian Europe than for his international blockbuster best-selling books known as the Millennium Trilogy, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, The Girl Who Played with Fire, The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest. The author is Stieg Larsson. His books were actually published after his death. You see them at every airport. You may read the books. You may have seen the movies. But Stieg Larsson was also the editor of Expo, uh, which was a magazine, a journal that researched far-right movements in Sweden and beyond. So we're turning to Sweden right now, to Stockholm, to speak with his life partner, Eva Gabrielson. She's just published her memoir called There Are Things I Want You to Know About Stieg Larsson and Me. We welcome you to Democracy Now! You did this work into the right wing together. Um, when Stieg Larsson wasn't writing these books, um, he was writing, doing his research for years into the right. When this took place in Norway, Eva, what were your thoughts? Well, I thought uh, immediately that this must be a madman, but a politically motivated madman. And uh, I, my thoughts uh, went to, to that this was an, a person inspired by some extreme right wing because he, he went to, to slaughter the, the youth at the youth camp. So I never thought it was Al Qaeda. Talk about. Um the work that you and your partner, Stieg Larsson, now known throughout the world, certainly not the case when he was alive. He only dreamed that the books, he, the, the uh, manuscripts that he had would help to finance uh, the research that you both have done, his life, his real life commitment. Talk about what spurred Stieg to begin his research uh, into the right wing. You talk about it in your book, the wave of racist violence in Sweden in the 80s, after which the extreme right became increasingly active in Sweden. Hmm. Well, he started being uh, more openly active uh, uh, already in 1983, when he started to write uh, for the British anti-fascist magazine Searchlight, which is based in London. And um, just because they needed somebody who, who could cover Scandinavia at the time, uh, we had racist incidents, we have racist groups, uh, we had neo-Nazi groups, and they all kept growing all through the 1980s. Um, so in the middle of uh, the 1990s, it was time to 
to also uh, launch a Swedish magazine, a sort of sister magazine to Searchlight, but make it its own, and that was Expo. So Stig was actually working on these issues actively from 1983 up until his death. His, his last article in Searchlight was published the same month as he died, that was November 2004. So he, he never gave up and he continuously tried to explain that these groups aren't deluded youth. Uh, you can't say it's their psychology or their social background which, which make them do these things. You have to understand that they do have a message and they do have a goal and you have to regard their politics and take it seriously and see where they are going. There is, you're involved in an ongoing legal dispute uh, with Stieg's uh, father and brother over the estate, um, which really, you know, it was after he died um, that these books became such massive blockbusters. But one of the issues you've raised and talked about um, was the reason that you, together with Stieg, for, what, some three decades, didn't get married, and it had to do with registering your location. Can you talk about that? Uh, well, we wanted to marry. I even We even got the rings in 1983, and I still wear them. Uh, uh, but we had to keep Stig safe, and he wanted to keep me safe by uh, making sure that he was registered as unmarried in the uh, Swedish public records. Because um, we, kn we knew uh, that they then, and still do, uh, use the publish rec public records to, to uh, uh, make up lists of enemies of of, of, of all kinds. Uh, these, these enemies are journalists, they are political activists, they are policemen, they are lawyers, they are um, politicians and so on. And Stig was on that list from 1992-93 when the first list was revealed in, in a court case. Um, and they, they continued to, to um, build on that list. Um, so by not marrying, it was, of course, possible to find his address in the public records, but it wasn't possible to find behind which door he was living, because his name wasn't on the door. Uh, he never paid any electricity bills, he never paid any, any gas bills, he never paid uh, any insurance, anything like that. It was all in my name. So that's why we did not marry. Mm. And it worked. It worked fine meaning you were both protected. Uh, one of the central themes of, um, of Stieg Larsson's work uh, is his research into the far right and the issue of violence against women. It is also something you are deeply concerned about, and when you read his books, you see that everywhere. Can you talk about why he was so deeply concerned about this and how he linked it into the rise of neo-Nazi groups, uh, right-wing groups? Mm. Well, he, he, uh, when you talk about violence against women or discrimination, uh, Stig used to say that there are just uh, two sides of the same coin. Uh, they are directed towards uh, different groups of, of uh, people in a society, but it's the same mechanism, it's the same ideology, it's the same uh, terror or discrimination that they want to, to impose, uh, to, to subject somebody to, to something to, to be able to get more power of their own. And, and so he never really saw any difference between racism and, and uh, anti-feminism, uh, just that because the, the, the extreme right-wing movements and the right-wing populist racist movements started to grow so much in Sweden and in Scandinavia, he, he never really got the time to develop his feminist views until millennium. So that's why that became such an important thing in millennium. And I also noted, I, I listened to the program um, while standing here, uh, I also noted that you finally have found out that this, uh, this Breivik in Norway, he's also what you could call a man who hates women. Uh, he blames actually women for, for the state of, of things in, in Europe now. And he doesn't blame the, the, the global economy and, and 
the lack of, of political and economical responses to that, which he should be able to do since he went to some commerce uh, um, higher education in, in Norway. Instead, he blames women, saying that, that we have, have destroyed societies, we are for multiculturalism, we are against men, we have made men to something that they are not. And I'm horrified to see that his, his long-term aim by using terror to destabilize uh, whole nations and the whole of Europe is, is uh, supposed to end up in a coup first civil war and then a coup where which uh, they will re-establish the, the patriarchy again uh, obviously with him in some kind of uh, lead then at some point in time and it's just it's just so backward it's just so horrible it, it doesn't reflect the ideas of Scandinavian societies at all uh, I'm, I'm deeply upset by, by by his writings, I'm even more upset by, by what he's done. It, it's, 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 please don't think that we are like that up here in the north. We, we certainly aren't. Finally, Eva Gabrielson, um, if Stieg were alive today, since he had been researching uh, far-right extremism in Sweden and Scandinavia, do you think he would be surprised what took place in Norway? Or do you think it links into the different groups that Stieg has been writing about in Searchlight, in his magazine Expo? Uh, in fact, uh, the shooter said in his manifesto, he said that he was working with others, and that's still being investigated, with other souls in Norway. Uh, I don't think Stig would have fallen into the, the trap of, of uh, sort of enhancing this man into something more than, than a lone, very confused person at this point in time. Uh, what I've been able to, to see so far is, is that he, his contacts with uh, the Norwegian Defence League and uh, a similar thing in, in, in Great Britain seem to have been a lot of um, uh, contact uh, by internet, by blogs, by emails and things like that. He doesn't seem to have been the kind of man who was able to, to be in groups with real people in, in real life. So uh, for the time being, and I hope the police investigation will show how much contact he had with, with others and if there is in fact any organization. but. Uh, it seems to be, so far, it seems to be uh, a lone, lone guy. i also like to show you a book. This is an official uh, government report from 1999, uh, which dealt with the destroyers of democracy. Uh, this was an uh, official government study into how to deepen and broaden and secure democratic ways of making politics. Uh, and Stig wrote a chapter here, and, uh, and, and it's about terror, it's about the Turner Diaries and these kinds of threats. So we have been aware of this in Sweden, that democracy needs to, to be deepened and broadened and, and practiced by, by more than politicians. And I'm glad to hear uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the, the Prime Minister of Norway, expressing some kind of, of the same ideas in his uh, speech to the Norwegian nation. Uh, last night. Eva Gabrielson, I want to thank you for being with us. I hope this is just part one of our conversation. Eva Gabrielson is the life partner of Stieg Larsson, famous for the Millennium Trilogy. And she has written a book about uh, her relationship with Stieg called There Are Things I Want You to Know About Stieg Larsson and Me.